Welcome back to the David Pakman Show. Early in May, we talked to Dave Zirin, sports editor at The Nation and also edgeofsports.com, about the Malcolm Gladwell article pointing out that he would argue on May 8th that college football should be banned based on everything we are now learning that we previously didn't know about CTE and progressive brain injuries to college and professional football players. We now, Dave, have seen an actual lawsuit that is taking place related to these injuries. First, give us the details of the lawsuit, and then we'll talk about the implications. No, absolutely. I mean, the lawsuit is the coming together of 60 different smaller class action lawsuits into one mega lawsuit. It involves more than 2,000 former NFL players, including a lot of names that even casual football fans would be familiar with, like Jim McMahon, who was the quarterback for the Super Bowl Shuffle 1986 champion Chicago Bears, or Art Monk, who's an NFL Hall of Famer. And what the players have all come together to argue as one is that they experience problems with post-concussion syndromes in their daily lives and that the NFL had knowledge that they could expect to have these problems and withheld that knowledge from them when they were playing. It's a very explosive lawsuit. It's the largest class action lawsuit in the history of American sports. And while the charges might sound difficult to prove, it might require a smoking gun of some kind, a former team doctor coming forward, it's going to be a serious black eye for the most popular league in the United States of America, if not the world, the National Football League. Okay, so this lawsuit specifically, like you said, is with former NFL players and families. What can we expect, or, or I guess the question is, can we expect this, and if so, how, to carry backwards in people's careers to the college programs, which were really the, the point of controversy, specifically with the Malcolm Gladwell article? I mean, it'll certainly be very influential, and honestly, it's already been influential. I mean, in terms of just the basic now accepted practices, as far as when you send a player back out onto the field, uh, the kind of language that's used in the locker room when talking about targeting other players, uh, which the NFL, of course, with the New Orleans Saints is characterized as a bounty system, when that's really like language that's always been in NFL locker rooms to a, to a large degree, um, about how referees are trained in terms of identifying mild concussive syndromes, about limiting the amount of full contact in practices. Um, all of these things are efforts to try to make the game as safe as possible. Now, the argument by people who are on the prohibition side of things, and it's not an argument you can really dispute, even though I, I am against prohibition, the argument that they make is that the game is really impossible to be made safe. I mean, there's only degrees of safety. It's like saying you can make smoking a cigarette safe. You really can't do that. You can have a cigarette that's more natural, that has less tar, that has a bigger filter, but at the end of the day, you're not making the cigarettes safe, and you cannot make football safe for human play. Do you expect any kind of effect on how the league runs its next season, the NFL, that is, as a result of this lawsuit? Or is the league going to do anything it can, public relations-wise, to just kind of, this is not going to be mentioned, and hopefully it will go away and, and be settled or just be, or be dropped? They are not going to go out of their way to mention it, that's for sure. And frankly, a lot of the league's activities uh, show them to not really care about player safety at all. Uh, you're going to hear a lot of talk this year without mentioning the class action lawsuit about how the NFL is taking these huge steps to make sure that uh, players are safer. Uh, but at the same time, they are still pushing for an 18-game season. That's a longer season than the current 16-game model, uh, which, of course, gives more opportunity for injury. And, and this is a bigger issue, they've locked out the NFL referees. Uh, NFL referees, they're not, they're not, for people who don't know, they don't, they're not referees full-time, like, say, a Major League Baseball umpire or a basketball referee. It's like a weekend job. but They make a pittance. And yet the NFL owners and Roger Goodell are playing hardball with them in trying to really drastically prevent them from getting any kind of decent wages and benefits. Now, they're being already replaced by scab referees who come from the Division Three and even high school level, not even Division I college football. And so the problem here is that these NFL referees have spent the last several years, since about 2009, uh, being trained in how to identify uh, pre-concussive effects. 
And the idea that they're going to be taken off the field is just another sign to many players that the league is really, uh, frankly, all talk and all public relations when it comes to player safety. I'd be curious to get your insight. We know quite a bit about the relationship and the amount of money that's made by, with the TV contract for NFL football and really with every pro sport. I'm curious to get your sense of when something like this happens, do you think that the league either explicitly or implicitly encourages the media that they have the carriage contracts with not to talk about this lawsuit? And then therefore, and, and following from that, do you think that the networks encourage all the different analysts not to mention this? So in other words, is there an active PR campaign in your sense to dictate what's discussed? I, know, I, I would describe that, David, as the Bill Moyers question, because uh, the case that Bill Moyers has always made about the mainstream media is that it's very easy to say that without saying it. It's very easy to create parameters of discussion by people in power with big networks without having to do something like call people into a room and say, stop talking about concussions, that the expectations are made pretty clear that you are a broadcaster, not a journalist and you are there to shill for the product, not provide any kind of critical insight, and that you would not have gotten to this high an echelon on the broadcast journalism food chain if you actually felt any differently. So we're going to see. I mean, I think that there are always some wild cards. There are always some announcers, particularly when former players are announcers, who are willing to think and talk for themselves. Uh, but it's going to be a very interesting thing to watch and observe. Like, how much does that uh, very carefully manicured facade get punctured because of the reality on the field that everybody sees and everybody is starting to know, that fans are starting to be aware of? Uh, will it be discussed to a greater degree? I certainly hope so. But we're going to have to watch and see. All right, we're going to keep following it. We've been speaking with Dave Zirin, uh, sports editor at The Nation. Also, check out edgeofsports.com. Uh, thanks as always, Dave. Oh, my privilege, David.